Um, what I think is coming back is that innovation at all levels of technology, largely driven by the massive compute power that AI, neural computing, will require. And so, again, I think my thesis is it's AI, machine learning, driven at a high level, but I met a couple weeks ago with a team out of NVIDIA that was startling in terms of how they were thinking about next generation chip development. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there are communications applications, clearly around 5G and all that. That will mean uh, for both premise and multi-premise and of course long distance and international. Uh, there are the wonderful opportunities that sit at the intersection of technology and media as Monica knows, as you know, I, I was a Marvel Comics fan when I was growing up here in Boston. So then uh, one day the CEO of Marvel asked me to fly to Florida, meet with him, he invited me to join the board and invest, and I was a board member and investor in Marvel Entertainment. Absolutely a wondrous experience. Uh, I can tell you about uh, almost not being able to hire Robert Downey because we couldn't get insurance on Robert Downey for Iron Man. <laughs> Uh, I do know who number two was, and it was not as good a choice. Uh, so entertainment and media, uh, I was on Legendary. I just finished my eight years at 21st Century Fox, which has been merged into Disney. There is an enormous amount of talent coming out of the media business that will be thinking about next generation streaming content opportunities, which is just one more example of how compelling many of the investment and entrepreneurial opportunities will be. And again, within the greater Boston, Cambridge area, uh, where we see different disciplines coming together with plans that are reasonable from a time frame standpoint. If we talk about quantum computing, uh, I'm very excited long term based on the best MIT and Harvard and Stanford professors I meet with. Uh, there's skepticism about the time frame. So as a venture capitalist, I have not made a quantum computing investment yet. But I would bet that two years from now, when you and I are sitting together in Menlo Park or Cambridge, Massachusetts, we will have each invested in some form of quantum computing. So I do believe it's too early, it's too capital intensive, if Microsoft is investing a billion dollars, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a good investment for Briar Capital or General Catalyst, but the talent and the innovation is phenomenal. And Boston Cambridge is very likely to be uh, the or a center of the world in an area like quantum computing and that whole ecosystem. So those are some thoughts. Yeah. But I'm testing and retesting okay. uh, these hypotheses, and that's why I love investing. Yeah, there's, it, I think you, you could literally go through each sector and have a profound conversation about why it's changing. Media because of its own issues, all the fintech is changing, all the industrial sector is changing, everything is changing. And as you said, I do think if you can put the right interdisciplinary teams together, there's a tremendous opportunity. May I say one other big positive that's changing? I'm looking in the audience and much of the history of Facebook is Mark Zuckerberg, rightfully so. But my goodness, hiring Sheryl Sandberg with Mark and watching Sheryl lead Facebook and build diversity into the culture in a way that was profound and not there would offer another opportunity set that I think is largely missed, and that is female-led startups, female-driven opportunities. I think we're just at the cusp of seeing a new generation, particularly here in Cambridge and Palo Alto, of female-driven entrepreneurs and leaders that are just going to knock it out of the park. Absolutely. So, um, you learned a lot from Facebook in its last 14 years and several complex years as a play. Um, there's a deep belief that venture cap capital is about helping build enduring companies that can really last, that can have 
uh, you know, long-term uh, viability. Everything that's being built with AI, thinking about accountability, transparency, explainability, and how we use this as one example, diversity as another example, they're, they're, they're foundational um, features in these startups that can make them enduring. What advice do you give your founders from the beginning to say, hey, let's, here's, here's the things you gotta be thinking about so you can actually build the next uh, Facebook and perhaps build it in a way that you're not gonna have repercussions along the way from fast scaling. Take healthcare, it's got the same issues in healthcare, for example. For, for sure, uh, the advice. Um, one, uh, the best entrepreneurial teams have intensity, courage, but in my experience, they listen a little bit. Maybe not always a lot, but <laughs> as venture capitalists and investors, a little bit of listening uh, can make a big difference. And so if we take an, a truly gifted entrepreneur, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the walks, the legendary advice he received from Steve Jobs and others. Mark is a phenomenal listener. Even at age 20 and 21, he certainly had his own views, but the listening skills, enormous. And I think that today in the interdisciplinary world we live in for the startups, with more diverse teams from the beginning, there's a level of listening and empathy that is more important for startups than ever before because if we're getting a Nobel Prize winning MIT biologist to sit down with the 28 year old machine learning genius uh, doing a postdoc and they're not communicating about product development and who to hire and how to scale the team and milestones, someone else will be pursuing that opportunity. And that would be the advice. One. Uh, Venture capital is wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful profession and passion because we're always learning something. And I continue to learn how important that early teamwork is in allowing companies to really thrive and scale very quickly. And I think it's more important than ever, whether it's medical technology, whether it's media experts coming together again with machine learning talent. So what is common, it's hard for me to fathom a breakout, truly revolutionary company that doesn't have some machine learning, AI, computer science as part of its core. And then bringing together the great physicists, biologists, truly world-class together so they're operating together. That's the challenge, but that's the wonderful opportunity for all of us and our children in terms of entrepreneurial opportunities. And that's going to happen here in Cambridge and Boston, in Menlo Park. And then it's going to happen in pockets of the world, again, um, Mumbai, Bangalore, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, where if we're not getting it right in Cambridge and Boston, Massachusetts, there's a team out there in Menlo Park or Cupertino that is, and vice versa. On this uh, point about founder listening, Facebook got a lot of pressure, some from structural and then some from its investors to go public when it did. Do you think it went public too soon? No. Uh, I sure remember the public process in the first six months after the public offering. Uh, and as one of the pricing committee members and after Mark Zuckerberg, Axel, and Jim Breyer, we were the largest shareholders. It was painful. We made a lot of mistakes. Um, but I still believe that the really strong breakout long-term companies at some point uh, should be public companies. And perhaps some go public too early. I think in other cases, with global competition. Uh, the late stage private equity capital will not always be basically free from an equity value standpoint for a lot of the startups. And so that balance, I believe, will always be important. Um, and I think that it's a shame that um, we went through periods of time uh, where a number of companies went public too early. Uh, which led to, of course, 
whether it's the dot-com boom and bust, or the financial services boom and bust. This is just part of the world of technology cycles, but there's a lot to be learned. Uh, I, I believe that the most important companies here in the U.S. and elsewhere uh, at some point uh, should be public if they want to be uh, competitors to the likes of Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, Apple, and other leading technology companies. Speaking of cycles, where are we in the cycle? <laughs> I, I, I believe we're closer to the froth uh, than uh, certainly to the bottom. Uh, I just don't know in some ways. On one hand, I meet with entrepreneurs and technologists uh, and in these emerging areas, obviously, uh, that there's reason for great optimism. I'm on the board of Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone, as a disciplined private equity, real estate, global investor, I've learned an enormous amount from the Blackstone team. I believe through that lens, uh, there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about valuations at all levels, public and private, around the world. And so I just don't know where we are in the cycle. But again, depending on the sector, the amount of capital coming in, marrying that with the opportunity and scarcity, uh, that's something that we as investors, whether it's a Series A venture capitalist or a great long short hedge fund, we just have to always be factoring that in. Yeah. So we have this mobile social cloud cycle that's already in 07, and it's perhaps a lot longer than we thought it was going to be, it's still going strong perhaps beat the peak of the market. There is a lot of interesting new technology being developed today that, whether it's AR, VR, crypto, uh, that's very nascent. None of those are actually uh, businesses today. AI is certainly starting to manifest itself into good businesses now in verticalized ways. When do you think some of this, genomics, another one, CRISPR, what do you think about these technologies and, and, and their time frame for becoming really interesting uh, enablers of innovation? Uh, de very much depends, of course, on the technology. If we take quantum computing. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking through a lot um, of these things. Um, I'm believing as a venture capitalist that in the next year or two, there are interesting Series A opportunities. Quantum computing in so many of its facets uh, will fundamentally change so much of the entrepreneurial and computing landscape, but it's early. I looked at my first neural networks deal in the late 80s. That was early. <laughs> and so then we think of FinTech. What a phenomenal opportunity. Again, it's a phenomenal opportunity for entrepreneurs, for postdoc students, and financial technologies, whether it's in and around crypto or different payments. Uh, there are reasons to, you're in one of the best in the world, Stripe. Uh, we're at the beginning of a phenomenal cycle of fintech. Um, and so I could go segment by segment. There are some which I think the major incumbents that are better than ever before, Amazon, Apple, and others, are going to either buy their way into or develop their way into. And then there are others where the interdisciplinary skills and the student university ecosystems are going to be so fundamental that as investors and entrepreneurs, we have an opportunity to participate in very dramatic long-term upside, as long as along the way we're hitting our milestones. So uh, we only have a few more minutes left. I thought maybe that I'll open it to, to the audience and see if there's any questions. Benita? Uh, we talk about academic Four times. And you think that was valid? I mean, it seemed like they did everything by book, yet still got it. Uh, so the question uh, is Page AI, the Memorial Sloan Kettering spin out. Uh, so much has been and was done correctly. And so it's a tremendous intellectual property license agreement. We have founders and participants at Memorial Sloan Kettering, many best in world who will benefit, the institution will benefit, but these spin-outs and then trying to 
part of the strategy there and in many of the other AI companies, start with Memorial Sloan Kettering or Mass General or MD Anderson as a hospital with a technology team which is trying to both do good and build highly profitable long-term businesses. Uh, I find that we're still fighting a lot of battles, whether it's between departments, uh, between cancer centers, uh, between academic institutions, a medical school and an affiliated hospital. And here we are in the area where one of the great medical schools of the world with many of the great hospitals of the world, cooperation is not always what it should be. And so I think that over time, these opportunities like PageAI are dependent upon the help and the cooperation of great hospitals and medical institutions. And at the same time, I also am the belief of the belief that without entrepreneurial energy, capital, milestones, intensity, uh, we won't deliver in this case a computational pathology solution that can save lives in leukemia. Uh, in Page AI's case, the first two targets are prostate and breast cancer. So these balances, these structures are extraordinarily difficult, but I do believe that that will be the big set of opportunities and how great medical and academic institutions become better partners will be one of the great challenges because as I said before, and I'm so fortunate and blessed to be part of some great academic institutions and, and nonprofits as a volunteer. In general, in many cases, the best institutions or the best departments are not partner friendly typically. And for the US and for the next generation of opportunities, uh, partnering between academia and startups and in the case of medicine, medical institutions, will be an essential ingredient, in my view. We have a question right over there. Hi, thank you for all you shared. Um, you've had this huge career um, investing in various industries, uh, various sorts of companies at various stages. Uh, I guess the question is how what, how do you build your thesis? I mean, as over the years, how have you perfected building your thesis in industries that uh, you may have knowledge, you may not have knowledge? Uh, you know, how do you learn about it? I mean, what's your recommendation to all of us as you know, we look out into new industries or even our own um, with fresh lenses, but at the same time with old wisdom? Thank you for a wonderful question. Uh, I love reading. I travel a lot, so I get to read a lot. Um, I'm a lifelong student. I love spending time at universities and with professors and postdocs and students. And I believe uh, very fundamentally in global investing and global opportunities, so I spend time. I've been in China three times this year. I was, as I mentioned, in India in December. Uh, I'll go back to China at least three more times this year. I just love testing, retesting, thinking through what the opportunities are. Um, and then I also spend time with the very best professors, postdocs at the different institutions here in the Boston area or in you California. Should, you should befriend Jim on Facebook. You see it on his Facebook timeline. I travel he's quite a bit. University to <laughs> university, he's there meeting professors. And I, I love it. I love academic institutions, learning. Being a lifelong student, I'm so optimistic when I come out of discussions and meetings on different campuses around the world, uh, which is not true when I uh, spend a day or two in Washington, D.C. Uh, so we, we don't have time for that. We don't have any time for that. Yeah. So I just, the intellectual curiosity, uh, there are certain passions I always knew growing up uh, here in Boston. Uh, on the Boston Globe, or those days the Sunday Herald or the Herald American, I would always read the sports pages first. And so we all know what our in interests and biases might be. Uh, I love film. I know that there are brilliant physicists out there and I'm not one of them. 
And so it's always testing and seeing how these different right brain, left brain functions come together. And that's true for investing or writing or academics or board members. And that's probably more true than ever before, as I mentioned. That's probably a pretty inspirational message to stop on, Jim. Thank you for visiting Boston and spending time with the community. Thank you very much. What a pleasure. And thank you, Ty Boston. <laughs>